Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Steve Traxler. I work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service over in the Vero Beach office, and I want to thank the organizers of this for allowing me to present today, and I want to thank all the presenters for this really rich dialogue that we've had down here about various, um, from underground conservation efforts to, to various planning tools and implementation tools. What I'm going to talk about today is a couple of things. I want to tell you a little bit about the Peninsula Florida Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And then from there, I want to talk a little bit about landscape conservation design and the blueprint that we're working on developing. Then I want to talk briefly about the Southeastern Conservation Adaptation Strategy. Um, I mentioned landscape conservation design. And then lastly, I want to, I want to leave you with a tool that, that we've been formulating for about a year now called the Conservation Planning Atlas. Um, that tool covers the state of Florida. The Landscape Conservation Cooperatives came out back in around 2010, and they were rolled out in, in different levels. There's 22 of them across North America. They cover um, all 50 states, as well as Canada, Mexico, um, Hawaii, and, and the Caribbean. But the, and, and the goal of these was is that they were to develop partnerships with um, as many different institutions as, as possible, from universities to federal agencies, local agencies, et cetera. They were designed to inform resource management about conservation. Um, we wanted to look on a, on a very broad scale. Kind of one of the mantras is, is you, you plan on a big scale, and then you implement on a local scale. What we've seen today is some great aspects of, of local implementation, but one of the things that the landscape conservation cooperatives can do is how does that roll up? How does that roll up into meaningful things like conservation targets? Um, one of the things that, that really pushed the landscape conservation cooperatives forward back in 2010 was this issue of climate change. And so some of the different stressors that we're looking at are things like habitat fragmentation, invasive species, um, water quality issues, or other, other issues of water. This morning when I woke up, I, I, I left my house about 5.30, and I got to drive across State Road 70 to come over here. State Road 70, in my mind, is a beautiful drive. You get to see a lot of different types of agriculture. I think I saw six caracaras, a bald eagle, sandhill cranes, um, numerous other aspects of wildlife. And to me, though, I also got to see things like citrus, um, ag, small communities. So if you haven't done that drive in a while, I highly recommend it. It takes about three hours. The other aspect, though, if you go just about an hour north and go in Tampa and take I-4 and do that same thing, drive from I-4 to Tampa to Daytona, all right, those are two very different visions of landscape. That's our choice. That's where we're at in Florida. One of the things that I, I talk about in all my, all my presentations is um, we're now the third biggest state in the country. Hopefully you all realize that. We just cleared 20 million people, about 20 million and a half, or up to 1,000 people a day, or maybe a little more. But by 2060, we're supposed to reach 36 million people. That's 16 more million people on the landscape. So do we want the I-4 corridor vision as a landscape, or do we want more like the I-70? That's our job as conservationists to help guide that. All right, so the LCCs. Florida is part of three different landscape conservation cooperatives. South Atlantic covers the Jacksonville, um, kind of a little bit Big Bend area. Peninsula, Florida is kind of Gainesville South. And then the GCPO covers part of the Panhandle. But uh, one thing we agreed to do um, with the Peninsula, Florida, was that we agreed that all of our science was going to go edge to edge in Florida. So we we're going to cover the whole state. That way we can test some of those integration or edge zones. Our steering committee is a, is a really interesting dichotomy of a number of agencies from federal to local, including some, some public-private partnerships and some, some private in, institutions, as well as military bases. And so one of the things, as you all know, in Florida, you know, working lands is a really important aspect of Florida. So silviculture, ranching, other forms of agriculture are really important. The, the goal of the Landscape Conservation Cooperatives is to come up with these tools to help look at this kind of big-picture planning but at the same time, if your steering committee is set up with the right individuals, hopefully those, those individuals or those institutions will come together and apply the tools to put conservation on the ground. Now, there's a lot of landscape conservation planning going on in the southeast, all right? I just want to briefly mention or talk about the process that, that most of the groups doing this are, are relatively easy, four steps. Convening stakeholders, then taking an assessment, turning that assessment into some kind of spatial design, and, and we've been doing this in Florida for decades, all right? Um, Florida Forever, P2000, as well as Amendment 1, all, all the, the application of those um, different um, funding aspects for conservation have all come out of different planning efforts, primarily um, the Critical Land and Water Identification Project database. But the key to this is, in the end, if you can take and go from spatial design to some kind of strategy design. That's where, when I've seen some of the talks here today, 
you guys are down the strategy design level. Typically, in the past, we've used fee simple purchase and easements as two of our main tools. What we're hoping to do though, is bring in other incentives beyond that. Um, like I said, we're a, we're a, um, a, a partnership that, that isn't regulatory based, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of different incentives that can be brought to play when, when looking at landscape conservation. And then the goal is, and Florida's had blueprints previously, this is P1 and P2 from the CLIP database, um, but it's been brought through our, our as a lens, our, our priority resources. And so what happened about six months ago, we got together our steering committee, we started kind of outlining our vision and what that could look like to key components and then priority resources and ultimately conservation targets. And so we have 12 priority resources right now and then we hope to, um, so we use a series of webinars and we vetted those priority resources with over 100 different agencies and individuals. And now over the next well, three or four months, we're working on conservation targets. These are the type of things where you can do on the ground measurable um, attributes. And, and actually, Lisa gave a really great talk. I, I'm, I don't want to be unbiased, but I'm hoping mangroves makes it into the suite of things as potentially an estuary conservation targets. The key here is that they're things that are fairly well documented. We're hoping for each priority resource, we're looking at roughly three to five of these targets. We're going to have a couple workshops. Next week, we're going to have a series of workshops up in Tallahassee from Monday through Friday. Um, each workshop will focus on a priority resource. And like I said, we hope to bring in stakeholders and get roughly three to five targets out of those workshops. And then in November, we're going to do the same thing in Orlando, uh, probably at the USGS office on the northeast side of Orlando. Once again, over, over five days, we're going to go through each of the priority resources and relook at conservation targets. What my colleagues to the north of me, the South Atlantic, have done is they've taken their indicators or targets, they've turned them into a state of the South Atlantic. They come out with this report card every year. In that report card, they grade themselves. That's what I really hope we can get to with our conservation targets, is being able to look at, okay, what kind of progress are we making towards conservation? And as we get additional conservation, or as we do better management on, on, the, on the ground, how do we score? How, how does each of the indicators look? Um, one of the things we've done down here in Southwest Florida is um, the reason that landscape conservation design is becoming really critical for some agencies, as well as a lot of agencies, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is requiring any new land acquisition for a refuge to be put in a context much broader than just the refuge. So they don't want just the refuge to come say, hey, I want these lands around the refuge. They want to put it in a context of why. So Panther Refuge is doing a CCP. In it, it has a land acquisition program. That land acquisition needs to put why the Panther Refuge needs to acquire those additional lands and what good are they? So the Panther Refuge will have to look at its objectives. We've helped do an impact assessment for them on things like the Florida Panther amongst another additional suite of species. They will then use that impact assessment and come up with a spatial design and vet that with stakeholders and then that will go in their CCP and will go up to our headquarters and hopefully someday get approved for that additional land. All any refuge in the United States, any new refuges, any existing refuges um, with land acquisition programs all have to go through this process. The service has over 560 refuges. It's a lot of land. All right, so ultimately then we come back to the landscape conservation design will yield a blueprint. The LCCs in the southeast, this is kind of a map of the different LCCs. They're all, we're currently taking those blueprints, we're stitching them together and the one big plan called the Southeastern Conservation Adaptation Strategy. That blueprint will be rolled out in October to the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Um, and those agencies hopefully will grab a hold of that and use this blueprint to help guide them in conservation in, in each of those 16 states, as well as across state lines, because you all know species and habitats don't understand state lines. They, but, but yet they still have to move across them. Now for the next part of the talk, so, so one of the things that we're responsible for besides doing these tools and doing this kind of science is we want to be able to disseminate that information um, readily. And so we've come up with all the LCCs in the country have developed some type of planning atlas. If you haven't used a planning atlas before, they're wonderful tools, mass amounts of information on those tools that let you readily integrate those. Unless you're a GIS expert, and then you can you know, go out and get your own data sets, integrate very readily. I'm sure Lisa's well versed in that. But, but this allows people like managers and, and, and others not so savvy in GIS to be able to integrate these big data sets. And so our conservation planning atlas, 10 of the LCCs in the country have all contracted Conservation Biology Institute to do these for them. And so they have a very similar front page. And then from there, there's just a ton of information you can gather off of it. 
So the Atlas, it's run through a program called Databasin. Uh, many federal agencies are using this program. It's, I mentioned it's designed by CBI, and it's designed for showcasing um, different data sets that are out there, and then the ability to bring those data sets together into different type of, types of, of galleries, as well as if you, want, if you have a work group and you want to need some work group space, this allows for that work group space to happen, and you can bring your own data sets in, as well as use the existing data sets. Um, so things like looking at the, the starting at the top and, and working through the home page, and then looking at different data sets, and then being able to use mapping tools. So we have a simple mapper and an advanced mapper. I'm going to mention each one of those in a minute. And then things like how to get started. There's a, there's a tour of it, and so you can take the CPA tour. And this is really an easy way to, to, to get involved with that and to be able to walk yourself through this. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a GIS savvy person, and yet I found this mapper to be extremely, extremely useful. There's a number of videos and webinars on this tool, so you can go look and see what other people have done, as well as how to use the tool. And then from here, you can explore different aspects of the tool. I'm just going to real quickly mention a few things. Um, this one is some of the different data sets. And the one we're briefly going to highlight, well, I'm going to highlight two. One is a climate adaptation scenario planning pilot program. So this is really interesting because as, as you hear a lot of talk about adaptation strategies, most people refer to these adaptation strategies towards climate change. But you can take on adaptation strategies towards any threat. And um, it's a really good process in developing, you know, what do you want the future landscape to look like? Once again, I mentioned the I-4 corridor or the State Road 70 corridor. Those are different types of visions. The critical land and identity and Waters Identification Project was used years ago to help really give one of the first um, statewide blueprints in Florida. All that data is on this site. You could go get that data directly from the site, but you'd have to request it. We've tried to integrate that data on this site. So you can look at um, some of the different data sets. You can really scale in. And one of the things that's really interesting about these data sets is, so they're not, they're on a fairly fine scale. Um, the scenario's at 100 meters. Um, I, I believe the clip data on this website is at 100 meters also. So you can drill and you won't see an individual parcel, but you can still see some, some pretty large areas. Um, the advanced mapper allows you to bring in your own data sets um, besides using the existing ones. This is just an application of the advanced mapper. Um, you, can, you can look at our priority resources, so you can take the 12 priority resources that we're working with. Nine of those are habitat-based, um, things like estuaries, um, uh, high, um, scrub and pine. Um, other things, though, that are non-habitat based, things like cultural and social resources, working lands, um, we, we may end up with one, maybe a water quality. Those can all be looked at on the advanced mapper, and you can go and you can do, put different scenarios on top of this. You can do a meter of sea level rise, two meters of sea level rise, three meters of sea level rise. Very interesting when you start comparing some of the future development scenarios with some of the sea level rise scenarios, and take a look at where Florida's heading. And so once again, it's up to us to make those decisions on what it's going to look like. And then these are different tools across the toolbar, tell you to zoom, look in, focus. You know, a lot of people like to use these kind of things when, when giving presentations to managers, showing really what the ultimate effects are of some of the issues that we're faced with. The Simple Viewer is a really fast mapping tool that has a number of different filters you can look at. It's designed at the HUC 12 level, and, um, and so the green here is different aspects of, of, of conservation. It, um, it provides two primary functions. Um, it's got a relatively detailed view of, of the conservation cooperative, as well as it gives land, land scale type data. And then we really have some interesting areas that we want to go in the future. Um, we're going to do a couple of things to the conservation planning atlas. I heard people talk today about fire. We're actually going to try and develop a statewide fire tracking tool. Um, it's, I heard one, one of the talks today talk about, you know, they have a long history of fire. It's really hard to go out, though, with all the different burns that happen around the state and find out what the, what the fire intensity, um, what type of burn cycles they're on, and they really amalgamate that information. And that's really critical when you're starting to design corridors and trying to look at whether species can migrate um, related to some of these different threats. Uh, we're also going to look at a project tracker. We're going to try and look at a tool that will help us track conservation projects, not just what the LCC is doing, but statewide, what, what institutions and agencies like yours are doing. And then we're going to develop a climate action toolbox. 
At the same time, the LCC has a couple of tools that may be interesting to people. We're actually going to look at all the threatened and endangered species in the Florida Keys and run some scenarios against those and come up with adaptation strategies. And then the following year, so that's this year, the following year we're going to actually try and do the same with um, state threatened and endangered species down there as well as state listed species. And then we're going to also get a staffer this year to work on marine conservation targets. Uh, these are just some of the um, names of our staff. We're a small group. Uh, we have a coordinator. Two people work half time as science coordinators, uh, myself and, and Beth Styes. We have a communications person, Lisa Thompson. Um, we actually, the coordinator comes on next Monday, Todd Hopkins. Some of you may know Todd from his old days working at Rookery Bay a while back. Um, this is a really good two links at the bottom our, our webpage for the LCC and our CPA, the homepage. So you guys will be able to grab this off the talk um, from this, this meeting. And then, does anybody have any questions about what I've covered today? Thank you again. Appreciate it.